code is all it takes to build your filters and apply them to images in MATLAB. It makes it very easy. Again, depending upon the size of the sigma, we get different amounts of smoothing. So here we're using three different sigmas of 1, 3, and 10. We build our Gaussians using the different size sigmas. We filter them and show them, and you see that we get you know, hardly any blurring, a little more blurring, and a little more blurring. That's all it takes to build these filters in MATLAB. So we talked about removing noise using a filter. Let's see how well that really works. Let us load a perfectly good image. Spoil it by adding some noise. I should really name the sigma to avoid confusion later. Finally, we know how to create a Gaussian filter. We define a size and a sigma. And then we can use the F special function from the image package. So load up the package first and then create the filter. Now we can apply this filter to remove noise. Note the order of parameters in imfilter. First is the image and second is the filter. Notice how the filter has smoothed or rather blurred the image. The fine particle-like appearance of the noise is now smudged. But the filter has also affected the original image a great deal. So noise removal is no magic. You don't get back exactly what you started with. Visually it might not seem very impressive, but image processing routines further down the road behave quite differently given a noisy image versus a smoothed image. Go ahead and run this code yourself. Try out different parameters for noise generation and smoothing. So when filtering with a Gaussian, which is true? Is it A? The sigma is most important. It defines the blur kernel scale with respect to the image. Is it B? The kernel size is most important because it defines the scale. C, altering the normalization coefficient, that constant on the front, has no effect on the blurring. It only affects the total brightness. And D, A and C. Okay, well, so it should be pretty clear that it's A and C. Why? Because the sigma is what defines the blurring. And then the constant in the front, remember that one, the 1 over 2 pi sigma squared? Okay, that just multiplies everything, so that's just going to change the brightness. So fundamentally what matters is the size of that sigma or sigma squared. Finally, a word of uh, warning or clarification at least. We just talked about sigma as being the width of a Gaussian, where that was the variance of the, of the smoothing of the blurring. Last time we talked about sigma or sigma squared as the uh, variance of a noise function, how much noise was being uh, added. So in one case, when we're talking about the filter, the sigma is in space, okay? Whereas in the noise case, it's in intensity or it's in the value. The bigger the noise sigma was, the more noise you added. The bigger the blurring filter sigma, the more you're going to blur. So you have to be, and, and the reason they're both called sigma is they're both using a normal distribution, but one is over space and one is over intensity. We can show those two sigmas here. And by the way, here I'm using images that go from zero to one, partially because then I know how sigma varies with respect to the range of the image, and partially because the slides that I stole off the internet did this. All right. So in the top row, there's no smoothing going on. So we have a sigma of 0.2 in the noise. That's a lot of noise if the range is only going from 0 to 1 or, or let's say minus 0.5 to 0.5. A sigma of 0.1 is less noise. A sigma of 0.05 is less noise yet. But then we can smooth it, all right, with a Gaussian, right? This is the smoothing with the Gaussian kernel. And the more we smooth, the blurrier these things get. And so for the same amount of smoothing, the thing with the smaller amount of noise with the same amount of smoothing becomes even smoother, right? So this image here is even smoother than that image there, okay? But this is showing you those two sigmas, the two Gaussians. Almost always it'll be clear from context, but since I've had situations where students say, wait a minute, I thought the bigger sigma was, the more noise we got. Now you're telling me the more sigma is, the more blurring it is, the less noise we have. And I say, yep, two sigmas. All right, that ends this lesson on uh, filtering and noise. And we'll start uh, going down further image processing next time. Welcome back to Computer Vision. Um, today we're going to...
continue talking more about filtering and sort of finish up the basics about that so then next time we can apply that to slightly more uh, complicated uses uh, of filtering. And we're going to start by developing some linear uh, intuition. And the reason that linearity is important uh, will become clear in a minute. Let's do a little intuition. So an operator, we'll call it H, or a system, is called linear if two properties hold. And for what I'm going to show now, both F1 and F2 are going to be functions, and A is going to be a constant. So the first property is called additivity, which is basically just that things sum. So if I have some operator and I apply that to the sum of the two functions, f1 plus f2, I just get the sum of the operator applied to each of the functions. It looks a lot like the distributive law of addition and multiplication, but that's additivity. And the other one, which is sometimes called scaling property, but is actually technical term, I think, is homogeneity of degree one, is just that if you multiply your function, in this case f again, by a constant a, and then apply h, what you get is a times h applied to f1. And so when you multiply by a constant, that constant just propagates through in a linear way. We do some multiplication, then we sum them. And because multiplication and addition are both have these properties, uh, basically the filtering operations we're going to do are going to be linear. And we're going to take advantage of that later. Question, which of these are not linear? A, the sum. B, the max of a function. C, an average. D, a square root. E, B, and D. Okay, well, that's pretty straightforward. A sum, well, sums are sums are sums. You know, that's linear. It's going to do the right thing. A max, of course, doesn't change, right? If I've got two functions and I'm taking the max, it's determined by sort of the single biggest value, and the rest of the function doesn't matter. And, of course, square root. Well, that's not going to be linear because square roots are never linear. I think you can figure that out. What linearity is going to allow us to do is to build up a signal or a function, remember an image, a piece at a time, and then be able to say how a linear operator affects that whole image, right? Because basically the way both linearity allows us to say is if I can sum up a bunch of things to make an image, then if I apply a linear operator to that whole image, it's going to be the same as the sum of applying that linear operator to each of the pieces and lets us talk about things in an effective way. So to do that, we need sort of these building blocks of a function. And the building block of functions is what's referred to as an impulse. And the impulse function in the discrete world is very easy to talk about. It's a single point with a value 1. And it looks just like an impulse. In the continuous world, an impulse is a little bit trickier. Because what does it mean to be sort of at a single point you know, and have some uh, amount 1? And that's where you have to turn on your calculus hats just a little bit. No, I guess you put on your calculus hats, right? And an impulse is actually a small little signal whose area is 1. Okay, so as the thing gets narrower and narrower in width, it has to get taller in height in order to maintain that same area. And in the limit, uh, what you get is an impulse. So it's got zero width and infinite height, but it's, it's integral, its area is one, and that's what's referred to as an impulse. We're going to mostly stay in the discrete world, so we won't have to worry too much about that. So the, th the cool thing about an impulse is the following. Suppose I've got some sort of a system, a black box. It's a, it's a function h, right? So, sorry, it's an operator h. And we don't know actually a, anything about it. But if I put in an impulse, okay, so I put an impulse into the system, I can see what comes out. By the way, that response is called the impulse response. Not, not all that clever, right? So what's really cool is if I know what the impulse response of some black box H is, maybe we call that H of X, okay, I can describe what this operator is going to do by H of X. The reason that works is the following. Since any sequence of pulses here, and we're going to do this in 2D in a minute, can be described by just adding in a shifted set and scaled set of those single impulses, if I know how this black box affects just the single impulse, I'll be able to say how it affects the entire image. Okay? And that's why impulse responses matter. So let's take a look at what an impulse response looks like in an image. So here we have an impulse, okay, and so here's our impulse, right? It's just a single pixel with a value of 1, okay? And we're going to filter it with some kernel h, okay? Remember, kernel mask, 
thing that we're moving around in order to make the, or our filter. So we have our H. So the question is, what is the output? And again, I want to thank uh, Kristen Gromman for uh, having made these slides so I can change them, steal them, move them around. So first I put down my filter, and you see my filter is over here like this, right? So it doesn't hit that one at all, and so its value is just going to be a zero. Fine, no big deal. All right, now move the filter over a little bit. Well, it just pulls out the F here, right? So this pixel right there pulls out the F, so an F goes right there in, in my uh, result. Move it over one more time, what do I get? I get the E. Move it over one more time again, what do I get? I get the D. So you notice that even though the filter goes D, E, F, left to right, in the image, what comes out is F, E, D, going the other way. And that's just because of how this correlation pulled it off. And it won't surprise you that it, not only does it flip it left and right, it also flips it up and down. And that's what happens when you do a correlational filter of a impulse. Just because of the way you slide it over, you'll end up flipping uh, that entire response. By the way, something that I was being implicit about is I was assuming that the center of that filter was what we were calling the reference point, right? So wherever the center was located, wherever that center pixel, that was the one that was being uh, entered into on the result, okay? You could use a different point, but we're going to just assume that the center pixel is the reference pixel of the filter. So here's a quick little quiz for you. Suppose our kernel, our filter, the thing we're moving around was size m by m, right? So maybe it was a 5 by 5 or 3 by 3, so m would be 3 or 5 in that case. And suppose our picture was n by n. Maybe our picture is a 100 by 100 or 1,000 by 1,000. How many multiplies would it take to filter the whole image uh, with that filter? All right? 2mn, m times m times n times 2, m times n times n. M times M times N times N, hallelujah, singing something. I don't know. It just seems like it had a rhythm to it there. So let's think about it. Well, actually, in fact, the answer, and we would normally write it this way, M squared, N squared, right? Because every pixel, I have to multiply all of the coefficients times the pixels there underneath. So there are M times M coefficients, and I have to do that over all of the N times N pixels. So the number of operations is on the order of M squared, N squared, which can get pretty large if M and N are moderate size. Later, we'll talk just a little bit about what are called linearly separable filters. We don't use them a lot anymore if you've got really fast computers, but it, it, it can make things be uh, much quicker. We had this problem of when we put in through a correlation we got back out sort of this uh, flipped thing, all right? And if you remember, here is the equation of correlation. We have this kernel H, and we sum over it, going from minus K to plus K, multiplying it times our image. And what that did was it caused us to end up with that flipped result, all right? The right way of thinking about this is that when an impulse comes in and it hits the filter, what comes back out is sort of the, this reverse signal. So the, the right way of thinking about the operator is there's something called convolution. And when we do convolution, that's what we actually mean when we say we're going to apply this filter or this kernel. And what convolution does is it flips both the left, right, and the up, down direction. You could have either flipped the kernel or flipped the access to the pixels. It doesn't matter. You would get the, the, the same value. And so that flipping gives you what's referred to as convolution. So by the way, if I was using a Gaussian or a box filter, how will the outputs be different for co correlation and convolution? That is, what happens if I flip my Gaussian? Answer, nothing. Okay? For a circularly symmetric or for a symmetric filter, whether I do convolution or correlation doesn't matter. It is going to matter to us in the next lecture, the one after that, when we take derivatives in one direction or the other, and that's when you have to be careful. But if you have a symmetric filter, it doesn't matter. So this can be uh, illustrated nicely in the following way. So here we have the equation for the convolution operator, and we're going to illustrate it like this. All right. So here we have our filter, and there's this little asterisk up here, and the asterisk is to show you sort of what the top right-hand corner is. When we do correlation, we just pick that up and then we sort of slide it around. When we do convolution, what we do is we rotate the thing 
and because it essentially flips it left, right, and up, down, right? You see that the, the little asterisk is now down here in the bottom left-hand corner, okay? And then, thank you, Kristen, we zoom that all over the image, and that gives you your output. So that's our convolution operator. Again, the difference between correlation and convolution only matters if you have an asymmetric uh, filter, uh, but now you know the difference. Like I say, convolution